Good evening and welcome to this, the regularly scheduled Shelvin Select Board meeting of September 11th, 2018, which I now call to order. I'm going to ask all of us in attendance here, as well as those of you watching at home, to observe a period of silence to remember those whose lives were lost to the suffering since of loved ones and rescuers alike from the events on this day 17 years ago. I thank you, and the first item is to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. So moved by Mary. Second. Seconded by Jamie. Any discussion? Any discussion in the public? Hearing none, seeing no hands. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next item is to approve the select board meeting minutes of September 4, 2018. I do have a suggested change, uh, which I am suggesting to all of us because uh, we would all need to be comfortable with it. On page three, number nine, the middle paragraph of the page, a two-liner, notes that Thomas Murphy expressed concern about the number of litigations the town is involved in and the number of lawsuits that the town has lost. I believe his comments were specific to the Vermont Railway in both cases of number of, of, a number of litigations and number of lawsuits. That's my recollection. Does anyone else share that? I no? Can't, I can't say. I don't know. No? I can't say. So I be know. it. Is there any discussion? A motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mary. Second. Seconded by Jamie. Any other discussion? Hearing none in the public. Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next item are public comments. Are there any? Please, Ruth. Okay. Hello, I'm Ruth Hagerman from the library. And uh, we talked some about how best to get us down here to regularly kind of comment on what was going on. And we thought, well, we'll just use public comments, see how that goes for you guys, okay? So the first question everybody asks me is, when is demolition starting? Okay, so demolition is imminent. Basically, we're waiting for the bulldozer to get done with whatever it's currently bulldozing. So we're hoping within the next week, as we've been promised. Um, the fundraising, people are interested in that. We have just a little bit over $300,000 for the match. So that then will be matched, making a total of $600,000. The library, um, I know we mentioned how our circulation dipped a little bit when we were closed for a week. You would expect about a 25% drop in monthly circulation and we didn't, we only went down to 85%. We're now back up fully normal. Everybody's found us. Um, we're working within the space. It's a little tight, but it's, it's working. It'll be fine for the next um, period of time. We are having to schedule programs at offsite locations, so that's going to be a little confusing here at the beginning of the fall. And then the last thing people always want to know about is photos. And so, so far, there really hasn't been much to photograph. <laughs> um, but we are working to get some photographs taken on a regular basis, also some video walkthroughs. Um, Lee has offered to do these things for us, get them posted, send them to the news regularly, get them posted on our different web pages. So the library has a web page, the library has a Facebook page, the town has under um, all of your links, you have a project link, and there also is a separate project web page, completely separated that, that its only function is um, to serve as an information source and that is www shelburne town center all one word shelburne town center dot org 
and you can link to that from these other other places but um, we don't have any photographs up yet because like I say we're just getting ready to have something to photograph so when demolition starts Lee's mm -hmm. gonna be out there with his little GoPro and take pictures so that was really all I had for this week is that okay. let me let me know how this might be working better for you guys I don't know if you want a question answer or whatever okay so thank, thank you. you Ruth. Thanks, thank Fred. you uh, thank Ru you Judy do you do you want to make any comments or you don't mean My name is Judy Frazier, and I grew up in Shelburne. <laughs> and um, I have a real serious concern, and that is the sign out there um, not saying New Pearson Library and uh, um, Town Hall renovation or what you know, other than community center. Uh, in <laughs> uh, putting an exhibit together for the 250th, uh, the community center, if you look at old pictures with Shelburne still as a dirt road and everything, was down in that area. Benjamin Harrington built the inn to, because he built the road from Burlington to Middlebury and needed, people would need a place to stay. Uh, he was kind of a good businessman. He owned most of Shelburne, where we are right now. And, uh, you know, the country store has been there a long time. The Pearson Library building, the original Pearson Library building, was actually Burgess Hall. That goes back into the 1800s. So um, for many years when I was growing up, this was the town hall. The Pearson Library was over there. And I'm probably one of the older people here that used the library from the time I was a little girl and could ride my bike up. My parents let me ride my bike up. I grew up on Harbor Road. Anyway, um, I'm really concerned about calling it a community center because uh, the library is supposed to be, my understanding was that the library was supposed to be um, a new Pearson Library slash community center. So since Ruth, you're here, maybe you can speak about how this was voted in to call it now the community center versus the original names that we all uh, recognize as historic building, building in the sense of the town hall I would call it an, a historic um, concept with the library because in 1923, James Pearson, a direct descendant of the daughter of Moses and Rachel Pearson, the first permanent residents of Shelburne, and Mrs. Webb donated $25,000 because on December 25th, 1926, the original town hall and um, school burnt down where the town's office building is now, if you look at a picture outside of the town clerk's office. So I really think we need to respect the history and the people that gave money. Uh, Pearson gave $38,000 in 1923. And I'm really kind of concerned about just giving this general name of community center because to me, the community center is really all this area. So somebody can comment on how that came about in changing the name. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth, would you like to? Sure. OK, so thank you for that comment. It's, it's interesting what, what people see. Um, so when we started this project, we, we had to name the project something. And so we settled on new library and town center project. Okay, so it's, right, exactly. And so that's just the name of, the, to encompass what we're doing, okay, which is more than just the library. We wanted to make sure people understood it was gonna be more than just the library, because it does include town hall, it includes some work at the fire station, it's including um, some different pavement work over there, parking. So that's the name of the project. We're not changing the name of the library. It is still the Pearson. It is still the Pearson Library. We did have so I don't know if you know Jane McKnight. 
Um, Jane McKnight is, is on the trustees, yeah. and Jane went back and dug all the way through. She went down to Montpelier, found all the wills, found all the documents. Um, we're not changing the name. This, this Judy, sign is just Judy, there's the, going to be a little Pearson bit of difficulty. Library. People at home are going to have trouble. Sorry, Ruth. I'm sorry. I'm People sorry. People are going to have trouble hearing you without being at the mic. I wonder if you'd let Ruth finish and then. I just yeah. want to correct something. All right. Okay, okay. So we're not changing the name of the library. We still have the sign that says Pearson Library. Okay. So it's not changing. That's still Town Hall. The nothing, the names of the buildings are not changing. Um, it's just the, the project has a name. When the project is over, the project name will go away. Okay. So I don't, I don't know if that helps answer your question or not. It helps me to Thanks, Ruth. Ruth, okay. Judy, you have right. to come to the mic yeah. if you would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know Jane McKnight. Jane McKnight, I'm very closely associated with Ken uh, Pearson, who is a ninth generation descendant and doing a genealogy on all the Pearsons. And he called me because he wanted to get the will, and I gave him the phone number for the probate court in Burlington. So I have a copy of the will that stipulates it has to be Pearson Library through perpetuity. I gave it to Jane when she called me and asked me about it. So we're all set, sounds like. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ruth. Any other public comment? Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is select board comments. Josh, you want to lead it off? Um, sure. Um, so I, 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 I just like to report that yesterday um, I received a public records request for personal emails regarding um, Vermont Rail. And I'm just curious if any of the other select board members or the town received a similar request. No? No. no. Which leads me to an even more curious, curious query as to <laughs> what, might, what might have... Uh, what was the impetus for such a thing? And wondering why, why now? But I just thought that was an interesting occurrence that I should share with the, with the board. And so the request has been forwarded to the town attorneys for their review and response. I mean, I mean I, I, the, the other point I was gonna say is like, I guess the other part of the curious is, since I probably know the least amount about this, I find it sort of puzzling. Nothing. Mary. Colleen? Nothing. Jamie? Same. No update. I just got a, a brief comment. It sort of anticipates some things I think uh, Lee is, is going to comment on. I prepared a list uh, of demands on uh, his and our time. Uh, I'm getting a little, a little antsy about the weight uh, that, that is uh, uh, beginning to really count for something going forward. Uh, if, uh, I'm sure we'd share copies with you that, uh, if none are available. Uh, basically, we have budget as well as the, the capital improvement plan. We have the comp plan. We have the town manager search and two ordinances just for openers. Uh, following that, there's the new library town center uh, construction, including a tenancy agreement with the historical society. We have uh, ongoing litigation of uh, varying sorts. Uh, we have an issue about a dog park and uh, recently uh, added prospective changes in legal and property casual insurance services. Not far behind are routine executive matters, the matters, the revision of the select board rules and the South Burlington uh, uh, initiative that we uh, are hopeful to take uh, regarding treatment plants. Uh, all of this is not to advertise our invincibility so much as it is to make the point that as we enter fall, uh, along with school kids, we're dragging a whole bunch of stuff behind us. And it's not either to ask that people not to bother us so much as it is. I think all of us have got to 
be prepared to economize time and energy because we got a boatload uh, in front of us. Can I respond? Sure. I, all I want to say is that if, if this were to uh, be a summary of all of the interim town manager's duties, I'm sure he'd uh, click his heels with joy. I, he'd, <laughs> he'd own it in a minute, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> missing from this, though, I think is um, the traffic issue that's been bubbling uh, for a, a number of months now, and it was brought up at our last meeting, and um, in all candor, we had to say that train hasn't even started up yet, let alone left the station. So I'd love to see that on this list. And I also want to say I really appreciate these lists because um, I think we're all spinning a lot of plates and to be reminded of what's on deck and what needs to be on deck and how to prioritize is very helpful. Any other comments? No, the routine executive manners hides a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy. Once, once we mention executive matters, that's that's not our problem. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. The next item is: Are there any comments from the public? Any discussion? The next con the next item is town manager report. Thank you. Just a few quick updates. As everyone knows, the sewer line project on Falls Road is. Moving along, we did hit some complications in the first week of that related to proximity of underground water lines and sewer lines. Some of these things are old lines and unpredictable, not well mapped. So that put us a bit behind, but the crews and the staff are working very hard to keep that on track. As Ruth mentioned, demolition of the former library building is imminent, and I know we all look forward to that day that makes it feel like, yes, we're making progress. There has been work going on internally within the structure, so the time has not been lost or wasted, but uh, that will accelerate rapidly. Uh, very shortly, you have two new appointments to consider for two of our CBCs, and those will be for three-year terms as per the policy. Uh, the Chris Robinson, water quality supervisor, raised a question to me, which I had forwarded to you folks a week or two back, related to a possible grant-funded project related to the whole process of improving stormwater management. The quirk of this is the timing of it. It would require, if it were possible to do this, it would require warning a bond vote for the November ballot. And then proceeding with a project that would have one year to be completed. Chris feels that he has one or another project that would fit the guidelines very well, be achievable within that time frame and that budget. It's a quirky thing. If we had known about this in advance, we would have added it to the sewer project bond in the first go-round. Even though it's a stormwater issue, it's somehow quirkily tied to the sewer line project. So it requires an additional $200,000 onto that bond, which would then be forgiven when the project is complete. So it's essentially, although we all know that free money is not free, it consumes a fair bit of staff time and energy to pursue projects. But on the other hand, it's hard to turn down the possibility of doing a project worth almost quarter million dollars that would not cost us any direct cash match. Chris will have more information about that if we need it. If it is still possible, and as you know, we're researching with the town clerk, the timing involved of whether we can get something on the ballot, whether they can program the machines for a separate document. If it is possible, we would bring it to you at your next meeting to consider approving that warning. So we'll have so, more information from Chris Robinson either tonight or at the next meeting. So essentially, this would be a guarantee. I mean, if it, if it occurred, if it was um, approved, there is no question that the grant would be available. That's my understanding, is the money is available. And we wouldn't be doing this and then risking us owing that money. That would be a perilous position for us <laughs> yes. to put ourselves in. Do you need a, a sense of the House tonight about proceeding to, to the point at least of uh, establishing what the window is? And It would be helpful to know if the board f would support that project if all the stars could line up the timing yeah. with the ballot getting it on the bond 
reassurance again before we launch this that indeed the money would be there for us at the end of the yeah. day. So the grant would be approved before that money was actually loaned to the town? We Because the bond just says that we agree as a town that we'll take out that money. Right. right. I'm certain that we would make sure there was an ironclad agreement in hand that if we did borrow that extra money that indeed we'd get it back in okay. some form. So we just don't draw down on that amount? And right. then the grant funds? Or are we reimbursed? Because we we've... Reimbursed? Until we know that the grant's approved. Oh, we get reimbursed. Right. Yeah. Okay. But Chris may have more detail. We're talking about that possible $200,000 bond yes. vote and project. And the question, of course, being, are we certain that the money is available? And if, if everything lined up to move forward with this, are we, will we be absolutely certain that the money comes back? Or it's is forgiven. Like, it's definitely 100% forgiven. That's a definite. Chris, Mike. Oh. Thanks. So yes, it, it'll be 100% forgiven, but it's all based on availability of funds. There's only a million dollars um, scheduled for this fiscal year, and whether or not we're kind of late in the game at this point, but whether there's still available funds, um, I last I knew there were, so. It's all based on that. So if, if it does get approved at the bond vote, then we move forward with an application. That's when we get verification that we're locked into the funds and we're good to go. The difficulty is going to be having to go through the whole process with engineering, getting everything designed and everything, still get out to construction and be able to complete it by November of next year. So that's it'll be a very tight timeline but it could potentially be done and what happens if you don't complete it if we don't complete it then I mean if we don't get it completed by the end of the project I don't think that there, that wouldn't be an option I would I would be sure <laughs> that it's going to be complete if we couldn't if we if through the engineering process we realize it can't be it's not going to make it then we'll just stop at that point for, for the sense Chris of the voting taxpayer so there'll, there will be exits should we should it be approved, but we don't get the grant. Correct. In which case we null and void that the bond. That Correct. bond. Yep. Okay, and that'll be clear to the satisfaction of voters. I would believe so. I think we we need to make sure that the wording in the bond is specific. That this is the only purpose that this money can be used for, and and be specific that way. So. Gotcha. Before you came in, we were just commenting to Lee as to whether he would value a sense of the board to pursue certainly the next, or specifically the next several steps about the available window, uh, what are, uh, what the time frames are, uh, what your uh, availability and capacity is given those. And that's what we were discussing as you as you came no, in. I apologize so, for being late. Yeah, no, just to, to. Yep. My sense of it from all the nodding heads is that yeah, we'd like we'd like you uh -huh. to, to pursue uh, the opportunity certainly to the to our next meeting with a sense of the timing and sure some thing. indication of what uh, what the you know, the burden is going to be on you in, in what is already a pretty crowded time. <laughs> Well, well, we'll get that on the agenda. We'll see what we can discover in the next 10 days or so and come back to you with a clear Great. time frame or whether it just can't be done. Super. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Otherwise, yes, there are plenty of executive issues out there consuming vast amounts of time, but oh, we don't we're, want all, to hear about it. we're <laughs> all doing our part, so thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? Next item are committee appointments, which Lee is going to introduce for us. So we have two applications before us this evening. One application by Patricia Fontaine seeking to serve on the Social Services Committee, and Caroline Weaver, who would like to serve on the Bike Ped Paths Committee. You've seen their applications. Again, these are under the new policy, the new application form. Uh, both folks have expressed great interest in serving our community. We thank you. Which of you would like to go first? 
Hello, everyone. I'm Patricia Fontaine, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I've been a member of the committee, well, in, attending the committee since January, and uh, as things are coming to us, I uh, was asked to, if I would join the committee several meetings ago, and so uh, it's time to step up. So that's my interest and involvement. You wrote a, 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 a very compelling letter, but it may be that, that we should share that with the public. Why are you interested? What do you feel you will bring to the committee's work? Well, I was really touched uh, having lived here since 2003. I had no idea of what the Social Services Committee was serving. Uh, it is a broad array of um, issues facing our community that often are quite invisible. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in is social justice and racial justice. And I've been training with the Peace and Justice Center and other, uh, uh, other training places in Vermont to really get the skills to bring that, those uh, issues to us so that we can educate ourselves as townspeople about these really uh, troubling but inspiring and hopeful issues right now. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you, um, I'm just, do you have any feedback on our application form since we've just started using this and I'm just curious as to how people react to it? Uh, you know, it was really impressive that when I uh, did it online, my name came up in bright red letters. <laughs> uh, but then it's to, after the first three lines, then it was sort of a hand entry kind of a thing. So um, it was very eye catching, uh, but also quite easy to. And, and I really appreciated the thoughtful questions. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Georgine, do you want to comment? Thank you, Pat. Just to say that Pat has been coming, I think she said since January, at least six months, more than that, and she's already um, worked in collaboration with the director of the library. We're going to be putting on a, a, a racial, what, what's the title of it? Uh, it's um, White Awareness Series. Well, White Awareness Series of three workshops. They've ordered books. We're ready to go with the publicity. So um, we're really excited about that. And she's put a lot of hard work without even being on the committee yet. <laughs> so we're really grateful to have her. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Thanks Rene. Any other discussion? Lee, it's a two-year term. What is, the, uh, what is the starting date? So I believe it would be a three-year three term three year. under our policy. And you know, the starting date could be now, if that's your, your wish. Why okay. wait? And it would go... Uh, and you could uh, run it through the normal cycle, which would be saying. through right. April, three and right. a half years out, if you will. That makes sense. Okay. April 30th or April 1st? When would the end date be? Well, let's call it April Can we do the motion ending April 1st, uh, sure. 2020? Two or 2021? 2021. 20, well, 20, typically they're three-year terms, but if you wanted to keep it on the cycle, you're, because we're mid-year, it would either be two-and-a-half-year term or a three-and-a-half-year term. Okay. It's uh, just going to be forever. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise well, we're, yeah. if there's no if, way to if, keep it. I mean, if she has, if she has um, served since January, I mean, it, you know, starting in this April, might work or and then so we up it, again so call it 21 2021 april 20 considering de facto mm -hmm. participation yep. de facto starting in april of this yeah. year good okay. idea okay is there a motion to that effect so moved moved by josh second seconded by jamie and this is to appoint patricia fontaine to a term on the Social Services Committee expiring April 2021. Any further discussion? H hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The next, thank you. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you, Georgine. That's a pretty high-powered committee, you know, that you're joining. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
The next, the next uh, a, a potential appointee is Carolyn Weaver to the Bike Ped Paths Committee. Kevin, the chair, is here. Is... Uh, Want to tell us a little bit about uh, who and where and how and what your interest is in? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Caroline Weaver. I'm interested in joining the Bikes and Paths Committee. Uh, the how is that I met Kevin at the Shelburne Day Farmer's Market the other week. Um, I recently moved to Shelburne um, from Burlington. I grew up in South Burlington, Vermont. Lived in Boston for about eight years and just moved back two years ago. So excited to be back home. Um, we bought a house that we hope we're going to be in a long time and definitely looking for ways to get involved in the community. Avid runner and cyclist and a little bit disappointed in the location of our home and having thought that it would be a little bit more accessible to downtown and other recreation areas and feeling a little bit on an island where we are. And when I heard that that was a um, somewhat universal problem for people living outside of the kind of downtown proper area. I got really excited to talk with Kevin about opportunities to get involved to connect some of these different island communities within Shelburne. Good for you. I couldn't agree more. The connect, the connecting is really the, the, the secret word there, isn't it? Yeah. That's the important. Growing up in South Burlington, I mean, I felt very fortunate to yeah. have access to the paths there. I have very fond memories of biking from Dorset Park all the way down to the end of the causeway and back and never really having to be on a busy yeah. road or be in an area without a crosswalk. And I know there's a lot of families here with young children who don't really get to enjoy letting them roam free in the neighborhoods. And I think it's a good long-term um, kind of plight to focus on. Anyone have a question of Carolyn? Carolyn or Caroline? Caroline. Caroline. When will this term end? So again, there are three-year terms. Normally, you know, if we same go thing. through the process, they'd all end at the same time. But yeah. my suggestion is that you... I have not been volunteering for six months <laughs> outside of my responsibility, so... Well, it may be... That, how about we do the same, same thing? You know, is that okay, you. Kevin? Do you want to comment, Kevin? Um, Thank you. Yeah, only to say we're very excited to have Caroline join our committee. Potentially, it was great to meet her at the farmers market. I'm glad you have the, had the opportunity to combine with the safety committee at that day because we got a lot of great feedback, and a new member came out of it as well. And we're always looking to have members from other parts of the community join our committee. You know, we don't want to be just stuck with a group within one neighborhood. So it's great <laughs> yeah. to have someone with the experience that she has professionally as well as growing up in a town that, you know, I hate to say it, we somewhat emulate in our committee. They have a great path system and we would love to tap into it at some point in time, but build out our infrastructure and go from there. So we're really happy to have Caroline as a potential member of our committee. Thanks, Kevin. Any other questions in the public? <clears throat> Any further discussion? If not, is there a motion? Move to appoint Caroline Weaver to the uh, Bike Head and Paths Committee um, with, for a term starting today and ending April 1st, 2021. 2021. And a second? Second. Seconded by Jamie. Any further discussion? Those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. The next item is the conflict of interest policy, the final draft presentation. Lee Suskin, the Ethics Committee Chair, is here along with Pete and uh, hopefully Bill, I'm not... Bill Deming. Bill's here. And Bill. <coughs> and you all have copies of the latest version, Lee, circulated. There are some extra copies on the table as well. Do, you, do either of you want to take the lead on this discussion, Mary? Um, I'll defer to Jamie. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take the lead. I don't, do you have any opening I, comments, I, Mr. I, Chair? I do, or would you? I do. Okay. I do. Lee Suskin, Chair of the Ethics Committee. Uh, good evening. First of all, I apologize for all of the paper that you've been getting about this uh, over the months and, <coughs> and even uh, since your last meeting. Um, but I think uh, hopefully tonight I can give a presentation with the help of Jamie and Mary that will um, get this to the point where you can um, move towards taking action. You've got a lot on your plate. Uh, I think it would be good to move forward on this. Um, 
So just, you know, briefly, as you know, we've been working uh, for at least almost a year now on uh, a new ordinance, uh, and we have um, accomplished what I think is to pr produce a clear, concise uh, ordinance that defines expectations for ethical conduct of the town's officials and that creates a simple mechanism for resolving complaints of unethical conduct. Uh, we've, t we've met with you twice. Uh, we've, re we've got feedback from you. We've met with um, your liaisons and we received feedback from them. And um, we produced a, an ordinance and I think you have the September 10th version in front of you uh, that accomplishes a number of things. Uh, it's concise, it's clear, it's easy for public officials and the public to read and understand. It focuses on financial conflicts of interest and their appearance. It prohibits conduct where the public official, persons related to the public official or business associates of the public official may gain financially or personally from decisions they make. It clearly and concisely states what conduct is prohibited, actions subject to a complaint, while defining de minimis conduct that would not be subject to a complaint. It clearly um, states what additional conduct public officials, when acting in a quasi-judicial setting, need to take that other, that public officials who are setting policy do not need to take. It does not address aspirational guidelines as uh, the feedback that we received from you, uh, how public officials treat others, but it does talk about working with you to uh, address that uh, for all public officials in, in a way that um, um, you recommend it. Um, it clearly states what actual or apparent conflicts public officials must disclose when they must disclose it. It clearly states when they must recuse and how they go about recusing and what they do following recusal. Uh, it establishes uh, uh, authority <coughs> and powers and responsibilities of the Ethics Committee to adopt educational materials and we plan on doing a lot of training on public official, to public officials on this so there's no confusion by public officials and the public what's expected of them. Uh, it allows us to issue advisory opinions if requested to, again, to avoid problems if people are, don't know what, what they should do. It, assists, it enables us to assist person, persons as neutral and partial resource to draft and to respond to the complaints to make it easy for people to file and make it easy for people to respond, to um, defend themselves. It enables us to mediate complaints or potential complaints when agreed to by the parties. Um, and uh, it enables us to hear and resolve complaints, to hold confidential preliminary investigations to determine probable cause, to determine whether violations have occurred by a preponderance of the evidence, and to t take defined steps to do an appropriate sanction of a public official that that relates to the uh, severity of, of their actions. Uh, and it also authorizes us to spend funds allocated to us by the select board and spend additional funds approved by the town manager or the select board. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Do, do we have the right? Version in here. This, this September okay. 10. It was sitting on. It should have been in there. You okay. Go. The you. Uh, what September the December 10 version does is it takes the uh, June I think 25 uh, ordinance right. that you had in front of you. It takes the amendments that we made in July Got and it. it combines them into one document. <clears throat> I did have one question, Lee, if I might. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I guess it's under the definition of conflict of interest. 
um, at the very end, it's, and this is added in red on the version that we had on our desks when we came in, a conflict of interest does not exist solely because two public officials are members of the same town board commission or committee. I didn't understand what that was going toward, what the concern if, was that uh, that addressed. If a, a complaint is, is filed, uh, well, let's say in, for the Ethics Committee, because we had this situation. If a complaint is filed against one member of the Ethics Committee, the ethics, the other members have to decide whether uh, they need to recuse themselves based on all the other factors. But simply just because it involves the other members, it's not an automatic recusal. Thank you. I was willing to defer to the judgments of lawyers on that mm -hmm. one. I figured there must be some. I think you've met your goal in terms of being concise and clear. I really think this is an outstanding product with all of the involvement and help. Uh, the, in fact, I'm kind of excited about what might be our timetable, notwithstanding the fact that our cup overflows uh, to collaborate on developing a conflict of interest in the ethics disclosure and compliance certificate. I think that's a really good idea and step. Uh, yes, well, yeah. uh, I think that came from our liaisons, if not the full board, and, I, and the committee agrees with that, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. Well, gee, I think that's a great step. Mm -hmm. Colleen, have you got any, any comments? Uh, so just a couple of things. One is the conflict of interest um, if two public officials are members of the same uh, committee or commission. I think that would be really challenging if to be on the committee and to be working very carefully with, uh, with your other committee members and then to have um, a complaint against you or against your fellow member and then to be able to be impartial about that. I mean, I think that that's actually uh, a crack in what otherwise is a very good document. And because I think that can always be called into question. Uh, I think I explained that before, and uh, I think it's the right way to go. And I think that's something that I think that a lot of people in the general public would be able to find as a fault. And I wouldn't want the entire thing to be questioned because of something that most people would say, well, that, wouldn't that be really hard for you to be impartial? Um, I, I explained it before. I think the general public can understand it. If, if there are other factors that may mean that the person should recuse, they should recuse. But the mere fact that they happen to be on the same committee should not be a factor. Yeah. I, I just want to commend the committee and, and thank Jamie and Mary for um, putting, I mean, I think this is a pretty good example of how ordinances should be drafted. I mean, the, the time that it's taken, and it's very clear that this isn't the, the same document that you started with, that you listened very clearly um, to the comments that were made, and I think you've come up with a pretty good document, and thank I you. appreciate the work. Well, I thank the whole committee on that. We, we yep. have a great committee. We work very closely together, the two people in the room here Three. and everyone when else came. on the committee. When came. Gwen. I didn't introduce Gwen because I didn't know she was here. And, mm -hmm. Well, the three people in the room, and uh, and and Mike Ashu and Tom Little, and um, and uh, we work very well together. It's a great committee, and um, we don't agree on everything on on day one. But we get, we uh, work together, we reach consensus, and I think we ended up with a good product because of how well we work together. Thank you, Lee. Lee, one question on, on funding. The Ethics Committee may spend funds al allocated to it. What, should we add a little more specificity around what types of activities? Is it simply in furtherance of the 
purpose set forth herein, or well, how should we, we capture we came, what's going to happen and try to put it in a box at some level so it doesn't? Right. This has been an issue for years, and we've been trying to. We I think we came up with something that, uh, as the years go by, will allow the flexibility to enable us to have the funds we need. If if you if the select board chooses to include a line item in the budget for us, that's that's great, but it doesn't require you to. If the select board, for other reasons, or the town manager at other times, we have a need, we will come to you with a request, and you can make the decision based on that request. I think it, it uh, I think it's um, an approach that can and will work, and allows the flexibility for make sure we don't spend money that um, no one wants us to spend. You know, so you're allowing for the decisions on on board and town manager and or both uh, to determine th this, the purpose of an allocation, which may either be budgetary or may be uh, in, right. in, in the run of events. Right. Rather than you know, my my hope still is that we receive a line item, and in the line item, you give give us an amount, and you say what we can spend it on. If you, if we if that doesn't happen, and we have to make another request, we'll we'll specify in the request why we want to spend it, and how much it would be. I like it because it anticipates that there's a possibility of a request and the right to request it. Mm -hmm. But the yep. decision isn't, uh, right. pat, you know, in, embedded in the rule. There's some discretion. Next step. Next step, if you're interested in pursuing this, would be to set a date and we'd warn a hearing and public hearing. Run with it. Are we prepared to do that? Do you need a formal vote or have we? We've gone through attorney review on this yet or no? This latest draft has not been. I'm but we did aware. initially, right back in June, the June draft went through. I'm sorry, what was the, the question? June draft was sent to outside legal. Yes. No. No. I think that that would be worthwhile. I mean, a lot of this is Probably. almost an, you know, a setup for, uh, to more or less develop a judicial branch of government that is staffed by volunteers that aren't necessarily attorneys and judges. And I think at least having an attorney look over the final ordinance is, is a good use of. Yeah, I agree. I, I think th as a diligence matter, I think it's we your, do your that decision whether to spend town money to have a town attorney uh, look at this when um, I don't think it's needed, but that's up to you. Um, yeah. Considering everything that happened in the last year, uh, yeah, I think so. I, 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 I feel as though, um, well, I know that Lee, you're an attorney, and, and uh, Tom Little is an attorney, and I know that um, reliance w was placed on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, other model ethics codes, um, and this is it's not an outlier ordinance, it's... Um, um, a com not, I don't know if I can say common, but it, it's certainly not um, novel. Um, so I, I would disagree with my colleagues that, it, that it's necessary to have the town attorney review this. I, I wonder what you would ask the town attorney to look right. at. I think we'd just have a, <clears throat> a review of the document from the town attorney's perspective, right? I mean, but, but I, what, I trust the right people have looked at this, but for our own diligence and practice. It's a good process to follow to have outside legal look at an ordinance before <laughs> no, it's adopted. I agree. It's been our habit, and, and as, uh, as much as this is carrying coals to Newcastle, maybe, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think a, a, a review by the town attorney would be, uh, uh, would be useful and important. It's a, it's a procedure we've followed. I don't think it'll uh, delay I wouldn't anything as I far wouldn't as anticipate. a public hearing. But yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I've got to agree with Mary. I mean, I, I, and and I won't. But I'm just sort of reminded of all the lawyer jokes that I could use at this point about how many. I mean, if we have at least four lawyers have looked at it so far, having another lawyer look at it. 
I'm not sure that that accomplishes a whole heck of a lot because then you become a question of, okay, how is that opinion better than three, four other opinions? So I'm not an attorney, so I can't speak from that basis, but I'm, I agree that given the comments we had last uh, session on our legal bills, if there are ways to avoid having more legal bills, that would be a good thing. The problem with doing that is that the next ordinance will come up and you'll have no idea whether or not to put it to legal review or not, right? Well, at at I, what I, point I, does this not go versus a stormwater ordinance, right? Well, and everything in between. But I think the difference is you've, you've had four attorneys that have been very deeply involved in this which is, would not be the case in the stormwater ordinance or pretty much any other ordinance. Well, I, Josh, I'd hate, to, I'd hate to abandon a practice of ours uh, simply on the basis that it defers to lawyers, <laughs> even though the practice is to defer to lawyers. Uh, I mean, I, I think I it's very involved. important that we... I'm not a municipal lawyer. Yeah, I think Tom's it's very here. important He's, that we I get... Mean, uh, our, our usual review of legal sufficiency, which in no way uh, disrespects all of the lawyers who've had a role in this uh, and who we trust are, are, uh, have already demonstrated legal sufficiency. But I think that's an important step. If necessary, we'll, uh, I'll entertain a motion and we'll vote on that. On what? On uh, submitting... Review. Submitting the final draft, can we call it now a final draft? Yes. To legal review by the town attorney. I don't know if we, need, I don't know if we necessarily need a, need a motion. I think we've got a, a sense of the board. You can instruct the town manager to, to send right. it out. I think just two cents on this. I mean, it's a small investment in peace of mind to make sure we didn't miss anything, right? We had a lot of smart people look at this. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's a good practice to follow, to have our outside counsel get eyes on it uh, my for sense, an hour or two. My sense, Lee, is that that's what we should do. I'm getting that impression. Uh, Thank you. Now, we can at the same time warn the public hearing, can we not, without risking? Well, the timing could be tricky and not knowing how long it would take counsel to review it. So if we warned a hearing, I mean, we could warn it. For like, for the, like the second meeting in October, and that yeah. should be plenty of time to get any final comments and final drafts if we needed to. But when you warn a hearing, you're typically approving a document to warn. Yeah. And if we're asking for legal review, yeah. my sense okay. is there would likely okay. be some changes. Gotcha. But I'll follow up tomorrow can, and I mean, let you know. Warn, can we warn it prepared? subject to town attorney? This review. condition by you could, review. You could, right. do, you could do that, and then... I mean, I really don't think they're, it'll be a light-touch review unless I'm missing something. I don't think they're going to have substantial comments on this. So I right. think they uh, can do it concurrently with warning the public hearing so that we... To be clear, I am not in any way saying that I am a legal expert on municipal law or ethics law. Um, and I don't, I don't know, but Tom may uh, disagree and he may think he is, um, but I'm, that's my only, I'm only raising it from the standpoint of time and expense. I'd like to, we've been working on this for very long, I'd like to get it done and I'd like to keep the expense down. How about we warn the uh, hearing for the 9th of October, which leaves ample time it should and another meeting of ours should we have to come back and and change that for some reason okay well is that Any actually correct if, if if is if we don't have what are we warning we don't know what we're warning yet correct? condition we're on warning. on review of legal sufficiency by the this. town attorney we're warning this document subject to town attorney review right so this will be well, I, th I think Mary's question is, what happens if he changes one word? Yeah. Then we would We, we have would time before it. the document. Yeah, I mean, we have... Cancel the notice. Yeah. Well, the other and option... We have a meeting have between a now and then to do that. So yeah. I don't see that that's any, any difficulty. So just warn it for, like, 
the next meeting after that, October 23rd. It's we a could... two-week delay. It's no reason to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. If everybody's worked so hard on this for such a long period of time, right. two weeks probably won't make that much of a difference. There's an idea, too, that runs it a month. That ought to be, and it leaves us two meetings in between. Right. And, and the other, following up on that, the other option would be to wait till September 25. Hopefully, we'd have legal comments back. Then, on, on the September 25, you could actually warn the actual document. Idea. Right. That's still have time idea. for the October 23rd date. You got it. Okay. And then yeah. it keeps it clean. That that's sense. a good idea. Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't okay. think Does that work? the committee needs to come back and represent on the 25th in order for us to warn the public yeah. hearing. I don't want to put the group out to come back just for five minutes because we need. That's a better idea. Right. Thank you, Lee. You're welcome. Thank you, Lee. Thanks well to the done. entire committee. Okay. A lot of work went into this. Just for, for the um, cameras, for the people at home, uh, the other committee member, Tom Little, has joined us. And uh, Tom didn't hear the praise I gave him before, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Um, Magnificent piece you, of work. Thank you. Maybe you want to invite Tom up if he's got any comments, Tom. Would you like to make a comment or two, Tom? Or anyone else on the committee? I think, I think council review is a great idea because you wouldn't want someone to say, how come you didn't do that? Right. And, uh, I think it's in good shape, but having another set of eyes is always helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to everybody. It's hard to boil down that document into something that's very readable and I think will be well received by the community. So thank you all. Not to beat a dead horse. Uh, but would it be prudent to put a limit of time on the attorney review? I mean, you know, sometimes we'll ask an attorney to do something and then you get a bill for 2500 and you were expecting it would be less than zero. And so maybe that would be prudent. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think in Lee's discussion with the town attorney, no doubt uh, the expectation will be something north of perfunctory, but a lot south of of rewrite several opinion rewrites letter, and five page opinion 18 letter. revisions and I'm sure Brian will know we'll have a pretty good idea of what we're after here but I will do my best to communicate yeah. that concept. thank you Mary thank, thank you. you thank you again that's a fantastic piece of work thank you <laughs> thank you much next item is Conflict of interest, uh, no. draft stormwater ordinance and fee structure, review and discussion. Do you want, Lee, do you want Ann to? I think we'll, sure, we'll mm -hmm. then lead off. So you guys are a little ahead of schedule, so Tom DiPietro yeah, is not happens. here yet. Oh. But Tom has been behind the scenes helping us out with a lot of the answers to your questions. Um, we've been working furiously um, to get back to you yeah, with yes. with uh, appropriate answers because I know this is complicated stuff. Uh, it's really complicated. Sense. So we're here to answer any more questions before the public hearing, uh, which is okay. two weeks away. We want to push Chair. this back until Tom gets here. Yeah. And we we just talk about yeah. Do you have any nine and ten? What, when do you? When might he be expected? And maybe any any minute. Well, why you know, not? we could get we could get started. I feel pretty confident um, that he has brought us up to the level that we need to be making us look good to you all. How about <laughs> we start with your responses to the questions I had? Sure. Because everybody has had those yes. answers for some time. Yeah. And yeah. if we get to the point where uh, we're we're still waiting on Tom, we'll go from right. there. And uh, I'm going to open by saying that. Uh, as you know, as I've already communicated to you, the, the, the ultimate comment, compliment of staff is uh, uh, making the board feel comfortable in answering questions that it might get in a public hearing, uh, especially when it's not necessarily an expert in the, in the, in the field. And this uh, set of responses to me did exactly that, and for which uh, Tom's here just in time to hear the compliment. Uh, for which uh, I, I thought was a, was, a, was a really a stellar performance. Uh, you might, you want to review those just quickly and uh, in doing so give the, give the kind of structure of, of expectations administratively. 
Oh. Right. So you had asked some of the more um, organizational business uh, structure questions that we really addressed when we applied for the ecosystem restoration grant. And um, Tom did uh, quite a bit of work on that. And when we were doing the project plan, we were really looking at, you know, how the nuts and bolts of this work were going to work. Uh, so some of the things that you asked about organizationally, would we need to uh, change job descriptions or hire a new person? Were we contemplating additional staff? Um, that was really contemplated in the beginning um, in our partnership with South Burlington. Uh, we don't have the in-house resources that we need uh, to start a utility on our own, and that's why we joined uh, forces with South Burlington, who uh, has a ton of experience in that. Um, so we would address a lot of the things that could come up in the ordinance and, and with uh, the work that we'd be doing with stormwater by utilizing Tom as our consultant from South Burlington. Um, once it's up and running, if, it, if you choose to go with the utility, uh, we can always see if, if that's going to work out. Uh, Williston, when they created their utility, they hired a full-time person afterwards. South Burlington, when they created a utility, hired Tom afterwards. Same thing happened in, in Colchester. Um, but knowing that we already have Tom for, to a certain degree, um, we, can, we can go from there and see how it goes. Um, so the setup having to do with software, hardware, there's really no hardware or training involved. We already use a billing a software system called NEMRIC. I think almost every municipality in, in Vermont uses NEMRIC. It's kind of a homegrown um, software system. And we just will create a new billing module uh, for stormwater. The, we believe that it can be just added to the water and sewer bills. So it's not going to be this whole big extra thing. Um, getting that set up shouldn't cost more than $6,000, and that's covered by the grant as well. Um, we will be doing additional outreach before the first bills go out via a postcard to all property owners. Um, I feel pretty good about the fact that we sent a flyer out to every property owner, and we really only got back about a dozen responses altogether. Um, at least I did. Maybe you talked to more people than I did. Um, but I feel that plus the postcard plus the work that we did with the um, large property owners already, uh, because they're going to be, you know, they, they're going to have the largest bill uh, with us. Um, and then the public hearing process, I think, is, is, is the outreach that we're planning on and we have been planning on. Is there anything else in your list of questions well, think, you really wanted the, to focus on? I think on? the bottom line is that we can be reassuring to uh, the taxpayer that this is not creating an elaborate, expensive, additional structure uh, of employees and costs, uh, which you otherwise might expect from just the nature of it, uh, the complexity, the, the, the technical uh, aspects and uh, the magnitude of the effort to, to, uh, to uh, establish uh, this utility. And I, I'm, I'm expecting that there may well be persons in the community who are thinking or wondering if we're going to create some, you know, elaborate additional expensive uh, administrative structure. So I found the comments very useful and helpful and reassuring, and I'm sure anybody in the public would too. Uh, there is an issue that, uh, that Josh and, and I each addressed, that is equity. Uh, I, would, uh, I appreciate the offer to establish at least two tiers. Uh, I do think that there's, in perception terms, a, a very important uh, uh, I think it's very important that the perception be that this is as equitable as possible. Uh, Josh will speak to uh, a, 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 a more equitable distribution probably than two tiers, and an interesting notion about uh, uh, plotting, which I'm sure he'll discuss. But I think it would be important, no matter the minimal uh, revenue production, 
for us to, uh, to appear to the public to be as sensitive as we, as we can to equitable distribution of this fee. So, so it's a balancing act between what you said before about yeah. not creating a sort of huge administrative um, exactly. organization and equity because the more you want to get granular and yeah. uh, uh, to look at things specifically uh, at the single family residential level, the amount of staff time grows exponentially. Yeah, exponentially. No, I think it's a very good point that you don't want to be self-defeating. Uh, but I was I was impressed at the response that that uh, two tier was possible and 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 could be followed. Again, uh, and Josh is going to address that in some detail. Um. Yeah, sure. Um, I, this might be in a in not the right time or forum for this discussion, but I find the ordinance complicated. To understand there's a lot of definitional terms I understand now why we need to do this ordinance but I think it would be helpful for certainly me and I'm gonna guess our vast viewing audience and members of the public to better understand how this ordinance works just in terms of a I have the executive summary it was very helpful but I think it would be really great if either you, Anne, or, or someone else give a, a rough, very, you know, 35,000 foot overview of how this ordinance works. Not right. why, but how. So Is Tom that, uses it every day. So Tom, if you want to, could you think you could give an overview? Sure. Of how, I mean, 35,000 feet. Yeah. You could oh, drill down as, as, far as, as, as far as you'd like to drill down. <laughs> Sure. Um, so, in you some want ways, to introduce yourself, Tom. I'm sorry for that. Uh, Tom DePietro with South Burlington, and I've been working with uh, Shelburne staff to, to put all this together, and working with the Stormwater Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm assuming. Do we do introductions already, Chris? Or do yeah. we're, we're folks here tonight? <laughs> we have a few here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, I've um, been spending a lot of time with folks on the committee to, to put it together. Um, but from a big picture view. The ordinance does a lot of the things that your existing ordinance does, right? Because you have an existing ordinance uh, that has items in there like illicit discharges. So that's in this new one as well. Uh, but the big difference here is that it establishes this fee program and it lays out how those fees are assessed on all property owners in the town. Um, and then kind of very quickly as you go down through the sections, um, it talks about processes for reviewing residential systems. So the town would take those over do all the maintenance, take the burden of permitting off homeowner associations, typically, uh, that have that. It talks about for any state permits that are not single family residential properties, there's a mechanism there for them to come under the town's permit, so the town wouldn't be out there mowing the grass and maintaining the systems. Uh, but it would be kind of overseeing the permitting with the state of Vermont. Um, and. I think going even further, a little bit outside the ordinance, the reason for this is a lot of the stormwater regulations that have come down on the town uh, from the state, whether it's municipal road requirements, uh, the MS4 permit and everything contained within that, uh, six minimum measures and the fluorestoration plan. Um, I don't want to be repetitive with stuff you guys heard before. If, so if there's questions, yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, I do have to, a yeah. question. If you could just describe how uh, a average homeowner, say somebody such as myself owning a 3,500 square foot home with a driveway. What is that going to mean in terms of her new bill that she's going to get? Uh, as it's proposed right now, it's a flat rate for all single family residential properties. Um, it's Whether I have a 10 foot driveway or a 1,000 foot driveway. Yeah, it's single family residential property, it's a flat rate. And as Ann um, mentioned, a big part of that is due to the administrative burden right. of, you know, I think it's 2,000, I think it's more than that, 2,500 of the parcels in town are residential. Um, so to directly assess those and continually update that, um, if there's staff concerns, you know, you don't want to go that direction anyway because they'll be spending a lot of time for very little value, sure. uh, whether it be equity or, in right. some cases, you know, the actual revenue generated to, to get down to that level of detail. But that's what it would mean. So, you know, we're looking around the $5 range, I think, is a rough estimate monthly. Uh, so, you know, a $60 a year annual fee additional. Um, I think we're going to present more of that later. I don't want to 
get ahead of ourselves here. I have one more question, and I'm sorry. Thank you for yielding the floor. Um, At our last meeting, uh, Dr. Parker expressed um, that it seems like Shelburne is paying, and this might be outside the scope of the ordinance, but here we are enacting this ordinance because of discharges into Lake Champlain, and we're not the sole creator of those discharges if we're measuring through the La Platte or Monroe or McCabe's. Um, and do you have any comment on that, on the fact that we're having to do this? Um, but as I understand it, not every single town has to do this? Yeah, so um, I think that is part perception, and part of that perception is the MS4 permit. Those towns that have this MS4 <laughs> permit are those that had these stormwater impaired watersheds years ago. These were identified. Uh, so South Burlington, Burlington, Colchester, you know, others, Williston. Um, there was a big burden put on those communities. And now with the release of new regulations, the Municipal Roads General Permit, for example, those upstream towns are going to have their own stormwater requirements, primarily dealing with roads. Um, and then there's additional new requirements for three-acre impervious properties that are statewide. So. Um, there is a larger burden on the MS4 towns, but that's not because you're downstream per se. It's because you've got these already impaired streams, Monroe Brook in your case. I mean, Tom, at, oh. I'm Chris Davis. I'm one of the committee members. Is it, could you guys, MS4 is any town that has a sewer and stormwater system, right? No. Yes, not necessarily. They have to also have an impaired water. And but, discharge in the Lake Champlain. Well, it's, um, not, it's not even Lake that. Champlain could mm-hmm. be... Otter Creek, it could be the Chess Floor. So the MS4 is a federal permit, and it's when you reach a certain population density, it applies to you, or as designated by the Secretary of Agency of Natural Resources. So there's very limited areas that have the population density in Vermont, but areas were designated because of the stormwater impaired streams. So big chunks of South Burlington, for example, were designated that way, even though it's only a couple corridors down Route 7 and other areas actually have the population density. Um, and this is, you know, going back but you have Virginia, 15 you years. Have Rutland, Middlebury, these are all towns, MS4 towns. No. No. They're not, no. Uh, they, don't, they don't reach the density. Nor Montpelier. I was only 14 in the state. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And thank you, Josh. Oh, I, I appreciate the comments. Before, can I ask one quick question oh, before no, you? I'm, yeah, I'm not, are, I'm not rushing here. Are we, are we anticipating that there will be no more private systems? Can a private system turn down our invitation? Absolutely. Is there a likelihood that it, it's in, all, inexperienced, Tom? So the new systems that are built to current standards, I'm speaking from experience in South yeah. Burlington now, those folks, new residential systems, right? Let's be clear. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, they can't wait to turn those over to the city. Um, because they don't want to be responsible for them anymore. Those existing systems that are out there that require some upgrade to meet new standards or maybe they weren't maintained um, and the rules don't allow you to turn over or the proposed rules. The ponds have filled in. and Yeah, yeah. you don't want to take over somebody's problem, so it requires those to be upgraded. Those folks have, generally speaking, been sitting back and waiting. Um, So new properties or new developments will get permits from the state and then they would approach the town would be the mechanism there. The town's not going to do the state permitting um, that's a pretty big lift. Yep. But people, again, people that have a permit, like some of the people we talked to on the committee, um, even some of the non-for-profits that might have a stormwater permit because their project's fairly new, they won't be paying twice, right? They'll be, the town will oversee some of that permit. They'll still be required to do all the maintenance on their own. But they won't be paying the state and also the town fee, right? That's right. So yeah. we're getting to a little bit of the weeds here. But right. for those non-single family residential properties that want to come in under the town's MS4 permit, so once the utility is created, um, they'd be paying the permit fee to the state of Vermont for any permits they have, and they'd be paying the town's fee. If they come under the town's MS4 permit, uh, those state permit fees go away. So that's one of the incentives to work with the town. Now, they don't have to, but that's certainly an incentive, I would think, financially. Does that raise our stake in any significant way in terms of determining uh, our status and load and whatnot? I mean, as if it were a population increase or by taking on those systems, do we, do we take on any chance that we're subject to other or, or increasing regulations simply because of size? Um, there is the potential for new rules 
right? So let's just say, you know, something in the future comes out that would apply to existing permitted systems. Uh, so there would be a discussion there about how to pay for it. And there's some language uh, in the agreements. So anytime a, the town would take over a system, we'd have some agreement that spells it out and the cost sharing and things like that and some of these future what ifs. And we can certainly provide that. Um, so I think we talk about chloride sometimes because, you know, these chloride TMDLs are kind of looming out there for certain streams and we don't quite know exactly what the state's going to require just as an example of something on the horizon. Um, we haven't talked about phosphorus for the lake. You know, we still have to pull that plan together as part of the new permit that the town's going to have to apply for in January. So there, there's a lot to be done already and more that's going to be required of the town going forward. Josh, do you want to? Well, I'd just like to follow up on some of the uh, your the questions, the responses to the questions you made, Jerry, and these may just be, and I'm just trying to understand, you know, the process that you're thinking of, of following here. So, uh, in, the, in the first paragraph, uh, or it's like third paragraph, um, it's uh, the process of developing the stormwater budget. You've already made a projection of what you think that the, the, our, our costs may be or the, what that budget is. And so is the uh, supposition that once the ordinance is passed, then you go about um, figuring out what the, storm, what the budget for implementing the ordinance is, and then you come back to the this, this select board with a figure because you've already identified figures, so I'm trying to figure out which, where, which, which is the cart and which is the horse. Currently, we have a, an estimated, we have a draft budget of what we think it's going to be. It's in the ballpark. Um, you know, we can definitely share that with you if you haven't received it already. So it gives an idea of what our costs are going to be going forward. I don't really see much changing from that. Um, and I would say after the ordinance gets passed, then subsequently right after that, you guys would set the rate for the next fiscal year. Um, probably based on whatever staff recommends. Okay. You guys can take a look at it. Yeah, it, it would be helpful to see the see the budget figures. Um, and um, I'll just go down. I don't know what number. Um, there is a statement here that in about enforcement that enforcement is handled now within the current stormwater ordinance. <clears throat> and I'm not quite sure what the current stormwater ordinance is. So we, do we have? Oh, we have we, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do we I know have? it's a little known fact. We already have a fairly <laughs> <Okay>. complex stormwater <laughs> ordinance. That would be. Um, I think it dates back to what 2006. Yeah. Seen it? Okay, um, <coughs> and you know back then we had a public works director, so it 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 has language in it that um, we would need to change anyway because it's really not okay. it's not working the way we're set up right now. Uh, and things have gotten so much more complicated since it was oh, yeah. created. But there is already um, st stormwater enforcement in place um, mm -hmm. if needed. Okay. It's, <laughs> it was just confusing. Would, would this ordinance replace that one? Yes, it would. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, and in other, uh, a couple places, it talks about utilizing consultant time. Uh, consultant time. Tom, are, are you the consultant? I mean, I... There is, at the bottom of page one, of uh, the, it says you will utilize consultant time. And then on, I guess, the third poem is consultant lime would be utilized for appeals. But I'm not quite sure who the consultant is. So, so I think of myself as municipal staff, but I'm referred to as the consultant regularly. Okay. That, yeah, I was just trying, to, yeah. just trying to clarify <laughs> that, or are we talking about something else? Um, and that's all I have, I think, on those. I think, thank you. I mean, that, that you did a really good job of, of I think, uh, addressing uh, Jerry's questions. So I appreciate that work. Uh, do you want to move on? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I, I, I think I'm somewhat at a loss um, because I, I did submit quite a few questions uh, myself and um, we received those answers um, right before the meeting and so I don't really feel like I'm going to have any ability to review those 
comments. Um, but even before we get to that point, um, one of the things, one of my comments was um, about um, uh, the possibility of um, incorporating the uh, blue program into this ordinance. And um, with everyone's agreement, I invited uh, the uh, program manager, is that your official title, of the blue program, Juliana Dixon, who is in the audience, uh, if she would make a, sm a short presentation. And I think that might be the, 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 the way to start before we move on. We can do that? Sure. Let me get this PowerPoint up for you. you got Would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Juliana Dixon. I'm the program coordinator for Blue, which is a <coughs> predominantly residential, but um, also commercial stormwater mitigation program. And um, I just threw this together as, an, as a general overview, but we can certainly go through it more casually. And I know many of the people here are already familiar with the BLUE program. Um, let's see. It's gone. There it is. <laughs> All right, so um, BLUE was launched in 2010. It's been active in various municipalities and townships across the state, um, but in a somewhat limited to degree based on grants as they come through. In more recent time, we partnered with the city of Burlington last year running a pilot program with support from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And um, that really took what was a relatively small program and launched it into something that I think is easily replicable throughout the state and also um, adjustable to the specifics of each, of each township and each watershed. Um, so Blue itself is effectively um, an education program, really. We go, we speak with landowners about water quality and discuss what's happening with our, with our lake, with our drinking water, with our wastewater, with our infrastructure systems, um, and just sort of help people grapple with some of the information that they're getting um, in somewhat fractured news segments. So we talk about that a little bit. We talk about how um, Lake Champlain affects all of us in Vermont, um, even those in Huntington or Stowe, um, you know, trying to connect the dots and, and help people. You know, there's, there's a lot of blame happening out there and finger pointing. And when we're meeting with people, we try to assuage some of that and help people understand how we're all playing a role in different ways. Um, you know, we're mostly familiar with the charts of where is the phosphorus coming from. Needless to say, phosphorus is not the only concern that we have, but um, a lot of the educational materials and conversations that we have, again, just help people understand the ways in which all of our um, developed lands play a role. Um, so then after we've talked about why it's important to engage with water quality, um, which is dependent on the previous understanding that the homeowner has. We talk a little bit about water management. Um, and typically, in my experience, that, that starts on a fairly simple level. Um, people often come to me and they're, they're pretty intimidated. They know that they need to do something with their land, but they're imagining they need to spend um, thousands of dollars or that it's, that it's simply impossible. So I do a lot of uh, generally just letting folks know that it's not necessarily that difficult to mitigate stormwater on your property. Every property is going to be unique. Um, it doesn't have to be what they perceive as, as, you know, like the infiltration trenches that they're seeing going in across the state. We don't have to have riprap on everybody's yard. There are options, right? So, um, I'll talk about, and of course, this is, this is property by property dependent and dependent on the hydrology of the individual site and what, what the impairment or what the situation is at the local watershed. But we'll discuss the volume of stormwater that's running off of the property and the various ways that we can mitigate that volume. And then we also discuss the quality of runoff that is leaving and ways in which the landowner can take action to improve that. <laughs> This is just a quick slide. I've had a couple of homeowners uh, really 
get on board and get pretty excited and we've got some, we've got some pretty fun systems that have been put into place. Um, Blue also does operate in schools. We do a presentation where we help students understand how they can take action to protect their waters. And we have them do property evaluations, teaching them about green stormwater infrastructure and trying to sort of shift to a culture of clean water such that it becomes as second nature as you know, things like recycling are now. Um, so the blue evaluation, this is just a screenshot of the first part of it, is pretty simple. We have a basic advanced and leader level. Um, that is how the program has been operating for the last eight years. When we partnered with the city of Burlington, they had some specific objectives that they wanted to meet that were independent of, of our typical evaluation. So we worked together to create a joint evaluation that would work for both of us um, achieving their objectives as well. If Shelburne were interested to partner with Blue, we would, we would need to do the same thing, making sure that the evaluation is something that was appropriate here. Um, when I complete um, an evaluation, we do a green stormwater infrastructure suggestion chart, which sort of goes through what we discussed in person. So the homeowner has the ability to reference not only the report, but also a little pictorial that references what we've, what we've already done. You probably can't read that, but um, I do track what's the most appropriate for a given site, um, whether that's an infiltration trench or a rain garden or permeable pavement. Um, and so we sort of look at what are the options that are available, and then the homeowner is able to choose what their, um, what's within their bandwidth to, to do. And then I just have a couple of pictures of some of the systems that have gone in. This is 12 North. It's a um, catchment dispersal system that uh, is, is going up the north side of the building and pulling water away from North Street. These are a number of the driveways that were installed through Blue BTV. And um, if Shelburne is interested to engage in a partnership to address residential stormwater, um, here is my contact information. So three years ago, a previous um, select board member, Tony Supple, also introduced uh, the idea or concept of this program. And so I contacted them, um, it was three years ago, this September. Uh, and somebody came out to the house and did the evaluation. It was simple and, um, and informative and basically said, yep, you qualify for this. But I was kind of expecting more like this, like, it, you know, if you do this, put in rain barrels or uh, extra gardening or something like that. But um, I, it, was, it was easy to do was before my time, so I can't <laughs> necessarily comment. Um, I know that I have made the process just slightly more complex than it was before I came, but I like to think that that complexity comes along with a higher degree of understanding and education. Mm -hmm. So, Any questions? Thank you. How does the partnership work? In other words, would we be using some of our funds that we collect through the ordinance to pay for this education program, or how do you get paid? <laughs> um, well, I'm an environmentalist, so we're just idealists, really. <laughs> 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 the program that we had with Burlington was funded through Newipick and Basin Program funds. Um, LCI in the past has historically used funding from the Little Act program, from um, the Vermont Watershed Grants, various sources of foundation and grant support. Um, going forward, the city of Burlington is looking to self-finance the program. Thank you. So where, where this fits, and the reason going through the, the uh, draft ordinance, um, there were just a number of, of, of points which I think um, Juliana hit on is, and that was primarily um, with the single family uh, residences in that, um, a lot of the um, ordinance really deals with um, the um, non-single family dwell, uh, residents. And um, it, it just seemed like a opportunity um, to engage um, the single family residents more um, on a one-by-one um, -one basis, so to speak, with very little cost to the, to the, to the town. Um, and um, with potentially, since there is a system of credits for non-residential um, 
residences. It just seemed like a fairly uh, painless way to both educate and um, uh, deal with some of our uh, uh, stormwater issues on a um, smaller basis than the, the larger um, properties that most of the, uh, the ordinance deals with. Um, so that's why I thought it would be worthwhile in this discussion to sort of make sure that the single family, single family residents uh, were um, uh, recognized as an important um, part of um, stormwater mitigation. Um, so I'm not sure how the board wants to continue. As I said earlier, it, certainly I haven't had a chance to read um, the comments that uh, were provided um, for this. Um, certainly we could go through one by one. Um, I certainly would like would have rather had the chance to look at them and and maybe the you know my questions are answered so I'm not I'm sort of uncomfortable to say yeah we should go through one by one because like and have everybody sort of repeat what's in here so no I think we'd all value the opportunity to spend some time with them we, so, we got them as you know tonight so yeah so and well, so I'm willing to you know um you know, push the discussion off until the next uh, the the next the meeting, next meeting. And yeah. to, to try to yeah. do that, which means we probably would have to change the public hearing date um, at this point, because I really think that we need to have a, a draft, you know, a draft we're comfortable with uh, before we um, go into the public meeting. We I mean, things like incorporating the blue program, I mean, how, how do you know, we discussed that possibility the last time, Lee, as to whether we would do the 9th versus the 25th. We ended up with the 25th and, if necessary, continuance uh, from there. Right. Do you, uh, what's your sense? Are we fully prepared to, to hold it on the 25th, or are we better to schedule it for the, for the October 9th? Well, based on the board's two things, if I may, uh, one, I'd like to thank staff for providing incredibly rapid Absolutely. turnaround. It was oh, helpful yeah. to get Absolutely. the questions in advance, but I'd like to Incredible. acknowledge there was quite an effort to turn yeah. those answers around in Peter a rapid included. Yeah, format. Yeah. So thank, I thank everyone for that. Based on the board's last discussion, the, we did send a legal notice to the newspaper. I'm not sure whether it's possible to pull that for this week or it's already programmed into the publication if the decision were not to move forward with the hearing on the 25th. The other option is if it's if it's already being warned, launch the hearing process, see how it plays out, and if you need to warn it again under the charter, then so be it. Well, we don't have a legal review of this. We, we did. did, in we fact. Did. We did, actually. We had a full, yeah, okay. full, le full legal review of this. Legal All right. is that, yeah. It would be useful to, to, see, to see that. Uh, well, this right. is the way to finalize copies. You're looking, yeah. Yeah. You're looking at it. Ordinance. Right, but I mean, certainly, there. I have some questions. Well, I'd like well. to see the questions that the lawyer asked, if any, and I think that would be appropriate to see the, the, the product review, if if that's not a, a, There were two phases, so there'd probably be two, um, separate, markups. two separate markups, but okay. I could certainly send them to you. They're very, yeah. the changes are very minor because this ordinance was based on South Burlington's, and yeah. so it was very solid. Yep. Um, there were just very minor changes. Okay. One, one, one point I'd like to make to you all, which is a point that we made several times to the Stormwater Advisory Committee, and, and by the way, I should mention several of them are here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Chris Davis is here. Mike Schramm is here. Um, Dick Elkins is here, and Susan Meganberg is here. And um, one of the discussions we had several times, what, uh, there were ideas to add this and to add that to the ordinance. I think what I would like to encourage you to do is to think about the ordinance as just a funding mechanism. It was not intended to address every stormwater need. Um, and, and there's things that, there's a lot of great things we can do with stormwater down the road. Um, but our first step is to create this platform 
uh, for funding the capital projects and all of the regulations and um, requirements that we have to meet. And that's very, very complicated just to get that started. Um, I think that a partnership with Blue is not a bad idea at all. I think that um, pulling it into the ordinance at this point would be complicated. Um, and Tom might be able to speak to that better than me. But my suggestion, if you want to make the deadline that we gave ourselves, which is to put out the bill, uh, the first bill in, in the middle of the summer, um, next summer, is that we go ahead and have um, the public hearing. And we've already noted that there's some minor edits that we can make. So we might be able to come to the public hearing and you know, suggest three or four uh, places where we can edit and maybe improve the ordinance. And it, to do that, you can continue uh, the public hearing. You put out another uh, public hearing notice with a list of the amendments. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I sat on the committee, so I'll, I'll share my two cents on this as well. I think it's really important for us to communicate very clearly to the community about this is a funding mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't get into, they, the committee certainly got into conversations about stormwater management practices and, and the scope creep on this is very easy. As you can tell, it's a complex document. As soon as you start layering in mm -hmm. additional content, it's going to get more complicated. So I, I caution the board to think about keeping the focus tight on a funding ordinance, funding-oriented ordinance, and beyond that, I, I think um, the getting into too much back and forth on, I think that this input's good, but I'm a little concerned about the timing, and I also think we can always amend it down the road. If we get to a point where, where we think blue is a good opportunity and we learn more about it, and administratively it makes sense to do that, let's Let's pick it back up, amend it, and you know, the, the numbers just don't quite, the juice isn't always worth the squeeze, right? When you start layering in a lot of that on whatever the dollar amount a year is, I think it didn't quite make a ton of sense to sort of put administrative time on top of that. But if there is an external source that can come in and manage that, then it I, makes total sense. You know, I'll repeat, I think, part of the discussion we had last year. And, and I've seen this, you know, for other things. I've had. I don't see why we really need to rush these things or amend them in the future. I mean, this is, seems to be a constant refrain that let's get something done and then we can, ref we can fix it later. It's not being rushed, Josh. I mean, the whole uh, concept uh, of having a liaison was it so we could accelerate All right, some of this fine, and not get but, through granular but, section by section reviews as well, a board, I, which isn't uh, the most productive. Well, certainly I have, you know, I've, I've identified some points that I, I think um, should be covered. And the second, and I'll follow up with what Jerry said before, I think the equity issue is really important here. And I don't think that has been well discussed. I don't. I, I don't have time, or I, I have not reviewed what uh, what was responded to in in my um, thing. But I, the the thing is critical is that Shelburne has to uh, remain affordable across the board, and my concern is that. From a purely from a funding mechanism, and this is what you know people have said, is um, I don't disagree at all with the idea of um, separating out or at least identifying the um, uh, stormwater costs separate from the property tax. However, moving from taking that funding out of the property tax into a flat fee it moves from a progressive tax to a regressive tax. And I don't think that should be done without ample understanding or looking at other possibilities of way that can be done because there are a lot of people for which that $60 a year may be significant. And I, I Understood. think, I mean, and that, I think we, have, we should take the time 
to discuss these that, things. That's why we set up the SWAC, is to look at all of that. And they spent a year and a half exploring all the various analogs in other municipalities, and they've had this conversation okay. many, many an hour. So if there's a way to sort of summarize it and, and lay out some of the input that the committee had and feedback, then that makes sense. But I, I think I, I'm, I still am concerned about opening up a conversation around restructuring the whole ordinance at this point. I don't think it's restructuring it per se. I think it's looking at other options. I think our role as a select board is to carefully understand the impacts of any changes or any ordinances on the citizenry of the, of, of the town. And um, my, you know, I, I'm not saying I have the answers by any means. All I'm saying is I, reading the ordinance um, on a number of things did not give me the feeling that um, the equity issues have been well addressed. And I think it's the, I appreciate, I mean, obviously, and I've said any number of times, there's an enormous amount of work, and I appreciate all the work that you guys have done. But the bottom line is the select board is responsible for policy. And we take the input from our, um, our, our staff and our volunteers and need to make adjustments and make assessments of those. And I, I, I feel like we would be uh, remiss in our responsibilities of keeping children affordable if we didn't really have a good understanding of all the different options that might be available to ensure that happens. Because, you know, $5 here and $5 there does, does uh, mount up and I think there's some real um, questions that need to be addressed. Thanks, Josh. I think we'll stay the course, it seems to me. Uh, but I think that we can expect, uh, and if we're, if we're wrong, we're wrong, but some public interest at the hearing on this question of equity. Uh, I, I mean, it's undoubted that you've wrestled with it and that the committee has spent uh, more than ad, more than sufficient time addressing it. I do think the 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 uh, the possibility of having a two tier is is really important to consider here. Uh, recognizing that uh, there's a there's a, a minimal sense of revenue gain, but there could be an appreciable sense of of community uh, better feeling about a, a an equitable step. Uh, I think it, I agree with uh, Jamie, I think it would be very important to add as an element at the hearing uh, a summary statement of, uh, uh, of how much consideration you gave to a variety of, of what would seem to be more equitable distributions of, of fee and why those were uh, were not, uh, uh, why you didn't dwell on them or didn't, didn't choose to follow them up. Uh, I think that's probably going to be useful. Some of that ans is already yeah. answered here. Yep. So we can just yeah. take a lot of this content and drop it in a different yeah. document if that's helpful. I mean, this is a, a, just keep really in mind, a, I know I just want to say there, there are puts and takes on this whole equity discussion, mm -hmm. and Tom will share his experience in South Burlington. Yeah. So in, in some ways, this is a more equitable approach than the current ordinance, right? Because we're now going to apply a fee to formerly exempt mm -hmm. properties. Yeah, absolutely. So that's right. more equitable yeah. in it, some sense. It's more right? equitable than what we have now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's more equitable than putting it on the tax rate, which is what we yes. have now, no. um, or right. what we would have if you didn't uh, pass this. To get to total equity, isn't it just isn't feasible. So there's you know, a possibly uh, considering the tier system that Colchester used, uh, Staff wouldn't be adverse to that, but that's probably only going to be a tiny amount of people in the second tier, um, based on the way Colchester is doing well, it. Even if it were 90, it's yeah. 90. You know? uh, but, I mean, you know, like you said, it's, yeah. it, 
it's a sense that those larger homes are, yeah. are, are paying their fair share. One thing to think about, and I know that, you know, sometimes logic isn't the best logic, but there may not even be a nexus to water quality um, with the tiered system. So um, something to think about. And, and setting the, the point at where you create the second tier, the easiest thing for us to do with limited staff, um, limited um, resources, is just to follow what we know has worked in one municipality. There's no other municipalities in Vermont that have a tier system. And the one that was set up in Williston um, didn't last uh, because there were so many issues with it, issues that could not be resolved by staff. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, it'll make it a little bit more challenging, um, but staff agrees that that would be something that um, we could do to, to address okay. that need. All right, well, how about so we stay the course, and mm -hmm. uh, this, as, as Jamie points out, this statement uh, is, some, is a summation of its own and just be prepared for uh, to have that available or, or to add it to your presentation. Uh, we'll see what the so uh, what the so will we be able to go through these questions at the next session? Let me. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm I thought you were going to finish with. Uh, meanwhile, we'll get an opportunity to read Josh's questions as well as the responses, mm -hmm. which none of us have had. And there certainly should be some some uh, uh, some continuation of, of of that and some comment about that to be to be expected, uh, unless somehow those can be resolved uh, between now and the meeting. Uh, well, I um, I can follow up with well, the just responding to the whole equity issue. I mean, I, as I said, there is I don't have the answers, but. I will go back to the question of, of you know, property tax versus flat fee. Um, and one of my suggestions was, it, it seems to me, and I think somebody may have said that, that, that there seems to be, uh, I, I would think on the back of the napkin, a correlation between impermeable surface and um, assessed value, uh, especially for single family residences. And, if you talk about a $10,000 assessed property versus a million dollar assessed property, I don't think they're, they're you know, if you have a flat fee, um, one's paying 100 times the, the, um, uh, the, the cost of the other on a percentage basis, and they're probably not producing 100 times as much stormwater. So I agree with the whole idea. It's not the concept of not taking it off the property tax, but it seems to me that one possibility is to see if there is a reasonable correlation between the two and then essentially say, okay, once we have our budget and we know that um, we need X amount of dollars and we know what the grand list for the single family uh, residence is, you can come up with a percentage um, and figure out how much that cost would be over it. It doesn't take any more, more any more staff time to do a percentage basis than a flat fee. Now, I haven't done the numbers. I can't guarantee that this is how it works. All I'm saying is there's a possibility of doing this that may um, uh, offer us a um, mechanism of going back to the keep keep Shelburne affordable so I mean those are just yeah, we can look for, I think we can look forward to, to that discussion uh, on the, uh, the 25th. 25th and meantime uh, we we stay on course and we'll go from there there may be other other questions from the public uh, resulting from tonight which we of course would in, would uh, invite and we certainly thank all of you it's good to see you again we thank all of you for for coming and again for your effort which is mammoth we'll see you on the 25th yeah thanks thank everybody you. thank you thanks tom do, do we want any public comments tonight uh are there any public comments on this issue Hearing uh, Linda. Hey, in the 
in thinking about this, I tend to agree with what Josh has pointed out. When I think of my little house on Falls Road with its little driveway as compared to some of the very large houses with the very, very long driveways, that does give me reason to um, give pause and think about what Josh has stated. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Dick, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Dick Elkins. Um, I have sort of the same concerns, um, but we, you know, we really put this thing together, and I think it's really important to get this ordinance online. And my thought was that next year we figure out how we're going to reconstitute the fee base. But I think getting the ordinance started uh, is a key. And you know, time's of the essence. So if we can't do it right now, let's do it next year. We'll put another commissioner and see if we can make it work. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Judy. Do you want to give Judy your name, Raven. Judy? Judy Raven. I live on Harbor Road. Um, I just wanted to say a little word about the Blue Program, which I didn't even know was going to be talked about tonight. By the way, but. Um, we had them come to our house, and I'm an environmentalist, and I thought I knew stuff. And so I was pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised to really learn a lot from their visit. And we were doing lots of things right, but there were a couple of things that we could do better, and they didn't cost a lot of money at all. And um, so what I wanted to say in favor of that program is I think that the more people who could be able to participate in something like this, then the more buy-in we get from people because they understand more of the whole complex system of stormwater and their contribution to it and what they can do about it. And I do think it actually makes it easier for people to embrace the idea that we all have to share the expense of it and the responsibility of it the more they know about it. So it's a good way for people to to learn about it and then be able to be helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Tompkins, Falls Road. I was just, uh, the equity portion of it, I understand, was because there are some large properties here in Shelburne that are apparently tax exempt. Now, I don't know if the town knows what the value of the property would be if they were on the tax rolls, but uh, if they did, perhaps we could simply say that for the purpose of stormwater, that they will pay a fee based on, on the value of their property, and even though they don't pay property tax, they'll still have to pay a, uh, a stormwater fee based on what they own. Yeah, that is the intent, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Any other comment? Please pass on to Marty that I, we hope things are going well for her. Thank you. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Next item is the draft capital improvement plan and budget, the initial review, which Peter is going to, to present to us. Not sure how to get rid of that annoying malware. No, I tried half a dozen times. <laughs> okay, it right. won't. In the right -hand corner. In the it doesn't yeah. work. Oh, it yeah. X out and it comes back. Oh, it really right. wants us to update. On this? Huh. Oh, okay. Let's <laughs> update it. Weird that it's kind of a virus. Yeah, line, line, protecting you against viruses. Line yes. goes yeah. away. I have the same thing with mine. Yeah, this particular version, it mm. was just updated, so it must be uh, more insistent. Yeah, it's probably coming back again. But. Um, so this is our first discussion of a process we go through each year, um, updating the capital improvement plan. Um, and just again, to give a 
bit of an overview in terms of why we do it and what it includes. Um, it's really in, it's, uh, intended to provide a long-term view of what projects um, we're looking at over a six-year period, starting with the current fiscal year and the following five years um, after that. Um, actually, there was a first here. Um, so it is a six-year plan. Starts with the current fiscal year that we're in right now, which has been funded and is in operation now. Um, and then the following five years, which um, are not funded and basically are just a plan at this point looking ahead. Um, the version that we distributed to you has over 100 projects in it. Um, we're not going to go through each one. Some of them are just routine things that you see every year, replacing vehicles, um, upgrading uh, computer systems, things like that. Um, and again, the projects um, in the plan are really not funded, but are only funded through a bond vote or through inclusion in the um, annual operating budget that the town votes on each year. So again, to highlight the projects that are listed here um, for the first year um, will take place subject to grants or other funding available that was assumed in the budget. And the projects in years two through six um, aren't funded. They're a plan at this point. Um, but I think it's safe to say the projects that we're looking at for fiscal year 1920 will probably be showing up in the budget requests that you'll be getting in a couple of months when we start working on the, on the annual budget. Again, the purpose why we do the capital plan is to provide a long-term view of projects to give um, the board and the public an idea of what department heads and committees are thinking of for projects going forward out over the next five years. Um, and again, is to try to, to uh, plan them so that we don't have large fluctuations in property tax or water sewer payments, try to spread out the plan so that um, we don't have uh, volatile tax rates as a result of that. Also, um, if we charge impact fees, which we currently do for uh, the CVU expansion that occurred several years ago, and also um, our recreation paths, um, in order by, uh, by, town st by state statute, um, to have those projects uh, eligible for impact fees, they do have to be part of a adopted capital improvement plan. So it's just another um, purpose, purpose of going through the plan um, each year. And also, it's uh, many grant applications require submittal of an approved capital improvement plan. It says the community's thought about a project um, and feels that it's worthwhile. So it gets kind of an endorsement to say that it's part of, if you're looking for grants for a project and has, has been included in the capital improvement plan, um, that's again, can be a plus for a grant application. Uh, the definition of capital projects, um, physical better improvement, um, studies related to capital projects, land also can, can be part of it, um, doesn't include personnel. So it's basically uh, capital projects are the physical projects that you actually um, would be doing. They don't include operating costs or, or personnel costs. Um, the version that you have um, in front of you is about $28.2 million. Um, again, that's over a six-year period. Um, and you can see the, the funding between the, the main sources. We have broken out stormwater um, separately. It used to be part of the general fund. Um, but we're, again, with the thought of the ordinance, um, we are breaking that out as a, as a distinct um, group of accounts. Um, the projects in this plan um, include facilities. Um, one thing that I noticed in updating it from last year, um, this building, some more maintenance. Um, we're plus 20 years since we've been here. Um, the roof membrane's going to need to be replaced. We've got store, stair treads that need to be replaced, carpeting. So we're starting to see some of the maintenance coming along um, with this. <laughs> Obviously, the new library um, is in the plan. That's been approved, so that's in year one. Um, buildings and grounds maintenance, we're seeing a need for uh, uh, turning over some of our lawn maintenance equipment and to give our staff uh, better access for some of our trails where they're trying to maintain those. Um, the police department's done some upgrades this year uh, uh, for their facilities, a new locker room and officer's room, and they also have proposed some equipment upgrades in the plan. Um, the fire department um, is indicating that the marine boat that they use right now is nearing the end of its life. It was pur purchased as a used um, piece of equipment. 
um, and they would like to replace that. And also the tanker uh, truck, that's in the outer years, but again, that's on their horizon as far as equipment that needs to be replaced. Um, the Bay Road Bridge, um, that's been in the plan just about every year um, in terms of that being replaced. Again, we're looking at grant funding for that and hopefully we'll have an update um, by the next, uh, when we talk about it next time in terms of where we see the grant funding and when a, a reasonable time frame would be for that. Um, Paving Pond Road, um, Paul Goodrich um, wanted to put that back in for consideration, I think based on kind of some difficult maintenance issues that he encountered and a lot of complaints from residents on there in terms of the, the conditions over this summer. Um, again, he put it in for consideration that has been on the agenda before and um, was taken out. So again, something we may want to look at um, and or at least give consideration to. Highway equipment, again, that's just turning over the equipment that Paul has. Um, we are looking at a couple of expensive pieces of equipment in this time frame, a bucket loader, um, and backhoe will be replaced other than normally it's just the routine um, dump trucks, but those are some equipment pieces that will need to be replaced also. Um, we included in this version um, the sidewalk and head path um, going up Irish Hill um, into uh, the Thompson Road area. Um, as we'd mentioned in previous uh, last meeting, um, the department was successful, planning department was successful in getting a grant for that. So we are putting that um, in the plan, uh, definitely in the, in, the per, in the first probably three or four years of the plan to try to accomplish that. Traffic safety improvements, you know, that's been a priority. Um, at this point, we've got it in uh, this year and also uh, an increase for next year. Um, the uh, Bike Ped Committee also recommended that we do some funding for Bay Road corridor improvements, shoulder widening, things like that. Um, so we've got about you know, 15000 a year in the plan for that. The Falls Road streetscape comes from a plan that was done several years ago to upgrade um, the sidewalks um, and landscaping on Falls Road. Um, that's in the out years of the plan, but there's still an interest to see that um, on our planning horizon. And you heard several meetings ago from the rec committee in terms of the beach house um, wanting to replace that. I think that's in year two or th uh, probably two or three of the plan as it's drafted at this point. So the next step um, is to look at the projects that you've got as our first draft, which was largely based on department head input. Um, it was some public input as well, but certainly would like to have more of that to make sure that those priorities are incorporated. Um, by ordinance, um, we do have to take this to the Planning Commission um, for their approval uh, before we go to public hearing. And we'll do that once we've um, done a revision, um, and gone through the revisions in it. So. That's just a brief summary. Again, we're not going to go through every project in it, um, but certainly if you have any initial comments, um, I will be working more on getting the funding picture a little bit clearer to show you what the uh, impact would be um, on the amount we'd be raising by taxes, what our debt and what the implications for debt would be and that sort of thing as we kind of finesse the list of projects and, and, and work on it a little bit more. But this is our initial cut at it. Certainly open for comments from both the board and encourage the public to um, to let us know what your feedback is as well. Um, I think that we should, uh, maybe this is uh, too specific now, but um, having been involved with uh, parts of the town center um, with respect to solar, I learned that it would be worthwhile to consider putting panels on top of this building. Uh, right now, the town spends nearly a quarter of a million dollars a year just on its electric bill. That's the town. A lot of that's the wastewater treatment. And maybe that'll go away if we end up in South Burlington with that. Um, but putting panels, uh, I think, on this building is really uh, fiscally prudent and sound in the long run. And I would personally love to see that woven into our plan. If we're going to be replacing the roof, uh, it would be a perfect time to do it. I think we'll Any other? see more of that when we get into the comprehensive plan. And mm. well, too bad Judy was just here, but she's on the energy yeah. subcommittee and yeah. I'm sure would have. 
full support for that. So thanks for raising it. Yeah, there are firms that will work with municipalities, and in many cases, because I initiated some projects elsewhere, there are firms out there that, you know, it's no, no capital cost to the municipality, and you end up signing a contract to buy your power essentially through them at a discounted rate for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we it can met be with, uh, someone whose name I can't recall from <coughs> Sun Common, um, and the Putting it on top of a roof is the easiest way to go. No permit ne needed. So you don't, ha you know, right now if we wanted to put, um, say, solar panels in the baseball field, then some of the town land neighbors have the right to uh, seek review. But if we're just putting it on top of our building, we don't have to go through that process. As I understand it. It's right, there, there are structural considerations and solar access considerations, but it's certainly well worth looking yeah, into. Yeah, the fellow was in the building and he sort of gave it a thumbs up just on his review. Mm -hmm. We came over and saw Peter and talked to him about it. So yeah, right. I'd be excited to see that happen. Yep, I agree. Be carbon neutral. Any other? I just have just a just a really basic question and this is not um thinking that one or the other is a good or a bad idea um but it was adding shoulders to the uh, road of bay road but a lot of the traffic calming measures is about narrowing the road so do you have any i don't expect you to, to have information about it i'm just curious if anyone does i'm not i don't think that either is a good or a bad idea i was just curious I could offer some insights if that's helpful. So many of the conversations about narrowing roads aren't necessarily about narrowing the physical pavement necessarily, but narrowing or starting oh, to stripe, stripe mm -hmm. a white fog line a little bit narrower so the perception is that the vehicular traveled lane is narrower, leaving a little space for bikes or pedestrians. The concept of widening shoulders is often worth considering, but I can tell you having been through some analyses of that, it can be unbelievably expensive when you actually start looking at the landscape with people who have landscaping or culverts or trees or stone walls and the sub-base that's needed. It's not just about paving the dirt a little wider. So it's a great idea. One project I was involved with, we had an engineer look at it and it was roughly a million dollars a mile when you started including all of those things that we don't see necessarily without really studying them. It's worth pursuing, but mm -hmm. it can actually be very, very complicated. I, I but assume the 45K is studies, <clears throat> right? Could be studies. It could be some work that can be done. I know yep. Paul did repave Bay Road last year or the year before and was able to, to put some fill on the or base on the shoulders to, to widen it a little bit yep. for bicycle okay. traffic. So yeah. hopefully we could be physical. doing some capital projects. I mean, certainly with the Falls Road, um, plans that we've been doing, we've accomplished that with, you know, fairly minimal funding. Yeah, Paul's got a few places on Irish Hill and Spear Street where there are steep, short little hills and very narrow sight distance where he feels we could make great improvements in bicycle safety with some small sections of roadway shoulder widening. And the other thing that I think, you know, maybe this is like in other business, but since it's come up right now, is um, in Williston, they're going through much of the same conversations that we have about the, uh, the traffic safety. And um, in a lot of neighborhoods asking for um, speed humps. And one thing, and but the, the counter argument is um, Paul will hate them. And, um, but it's also hard on emergency services, like things like trying to put in IVs uh, in, on roads with a lot of speed humps is impossible. And um, so that's the argument. But one thing that they talked about was having speed humps that um, you are temporary. So you only put them in during the summer right. and then you take them out in the winter, which would at least take away um, a lot of uh, um, Paul's argument about plowing during the winter. when natural conditions kind of slow down traffic to begin with. But anyway, just something to, that I was just reading about. Just following up on that, I did pass a, a, a link on to, to Lee and Jerry about this uh, system they had in Iceland for sort of doing 3D um, crosswalks, which supposedly visually worked really well and sort of really replaced the idea of a speed hump. So I just thought that was somebody passed the link on to me, and I just thought, Oh, 
Well, that's a, that, that's a novel idea. Is it striping it in a way? It's that? striping that, I mean, from the pictures, it looked like it, it was, it just gave you the impression that there was a bump, there was a, 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 like a, a yeah, huh. a, it was just a really interesting and maybe very simple, who knows how much it costs, but it's just painting. Um, but it, <laughs> it looks like stepping stones yeah. to, to the, huh. yeah. yeah. Could you send I'll send, I'll send that to you. Yeah. I'll send yes, it I don't want to go off any further I'll off topic, but I'm just curious. And the only other item that my broken record thing will, and I briefly did, talked about it with, with Lee ahead, um, is that there a, is a line here for um, AV improvements. Um, and last time this was discussed in the larger scale, you know, we were talking more in the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range rather than the five thousand dollar range, and Where so is that one? this is on page. It's under town offices. I don't know the pages aren't numbered, so I can't tell you. Um, um, about right, sort of the second to the page last two. in town offices. Yeah, got it. Got it. And so I hope we, I still hope we can do some improvements even this year, but I certainly would like to have a, a significant, even if it's not all used, at least recognize that I, I just can't think of anything that's more important to the public than being able to um, access uh, meetings remotely and contribute and anything and, and make it a, a better exercise for or, or something that people really want to do. And so I think if you, if you prioritize where we spend money, I, I just think that's a... I agree. A, if there are hard. dollars this budget cycle, it'd be nice to just start the ball. Yeah, yeah. that's right. what I'm hoping that we can do. On that? I'm already looking into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Lee's been working yeah. on it. He's got some ideas. Um, but I, th I think just making sure we have um, money available if we don't have uh, the funds we need, all the funds we need. And again, there's lots of different options. And I'm not talking about the, we need the Cadillac option. Um, but um, it, if it's in the budget, at least we have the, you know, we, we can consider um, different ways of doing things. Peter, this, the stormwater numbers, those, I assume, are, are good numbers, right? We've, the 1.1? I feel like that number used to be higher, considerably uh, higher. But maybe I'm just, because we looked at this, of course, on the Planning Commission, and those are sections we were always focused on. And when we, yeah, these 1.1. One one. So sorry. These numbers were provided by Chris Robinson, okay. so I think he's probably refined um, what he was looking at in terms of what projects he can feasibly have yeah. engineered and get accomplished in a five-year period. A total of four to five. Yep. Good. No, I just want to yeah, reconfirm that. Engineering uh, estimates. Remember. Yes. And a run rate to eight at one point. And the Falls Road <coughs> streetscape, the 900K. Can you? <coughs> Expand on that a little bit. What is that exactly? Is that traffic calming? Is that trees? Um, I, you'd have to talk to Dean more That's about Dean. that. Um, okay. That was a, a project that um, he had worked on. I believe they had a grant to do some design work. My sense is that it's um, not necessarily traffic calming, but more landscaping, Landscape. sidewalks. Um, some tree planting, things like that, um, in that area. But Dean would definitely be the one that would okay. be more knowledgeable on what that includes. Thank you. I'm sure Peter will 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 value comments from us as soon as we can provide them. So I would encourage everybody to submit further questions and whatnot. Next next meeting's going to be a busy one as well, and and the next one and the next. It will be helpful, I'm sure. Uh, any other any questions from the public? Any other discussion from the board? Peter, thank you. No, Thanks, thank Peter. you, thank yes. you, Peter. Fantastic job as <clears throat> usual.
Uh, the next item is informal select board listening sessions. This continues a discussion that we, in, we began uh, at the last meeting. And uh, Lee, do you want to set the scene? Thank you. So Josh had raised the idea of whether it might be helpful for one or two select board members at various times and locations to have a more informal, create a more informal opportunity for citizens to sit down and have conversations, ask questions outside of this more formal structure of, of your regular board meetings. And we had, a, I think, a productive conversation at the last meeting, and the spectrum of ideas ranged from, um, as Josh had suggested, setting up actually a structured approach to creating these opportunities to letting things happen in a more a less structured way. Mary mentioned that she goes to the farmer's market on Saturdays, and if other members were willing and able in their own life schedules to create those opportunities, that perhaps that was a better approach. So the spectrum ranged from no structure, and we all create opportunities to be out there on the street, if you will, to, as Josh had suggested, actually creating a more formalized approach to things. The primary question that seemed to emerge was whether in some way that created some kind of a violation of the open meeting law. Personally, I don't necessarily see that, but others would have a very different opinion on that. And ultimately, it's up to you as board members to determine whether the, I think the idea is great. The real question seemed to be what level of formality or structures was appropriate or necessary to help make sure it actually happened. Do you have a concrete idea in mind or things that you were thinking about specifically other, for us other to... Other than what I presented than, last... Okay. I, I didn't really... I mean, I did talk to a couple um, people uh, about um, the whole open meetings issue and they, they really didn't think... You know, I think Mary's point was well taken that if another... If you, if you only have two people avail, you know, there, it's not a problem. If somebody else shows up, that's a problem. That's the only other. Uh... I kind of felt like it could also be a bit of a problem because what your um, proposed, I think, rule or procedure called for was that whoever the invite tour was, mm -hmm. whoever was inviting, had to keep notes of mm -hmm. what was happening, and then we that would get transmitted here. And to me, I I, I understand the goal. It's laudable. You're trying to increase access but to me that i felt was a little bit uh scary to me in terms of whether or not that would be tr getting around the open meeting law and perhaps causing a problem that way that was my concern and my reaction in addition to um, the whole idea of perhaps creating a problem if a member of the board really wanted to attend a meeting for one reason or another and couldn't because two others were had been invited. And I suppose it's, um, I think, uh, Jamie, you said, I mean, how often is this likely to happen? <laughs> um, Where the three of us show up? Yeah. <laughs> Unlikely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then there was the whole concept of the farmer's market kind of thing. So I'm in favor small of... Business, small business association. Right. I'm, a, I'm in favor of all of us as elected officials keeping our fingers on the pulse of the community in every way we can with the time and resources we have. Going to the farmer's market or simply letting it be known that you are available to be spoken mm -hmm. with, and, you know, posting things on front porch forum, that kind of thing, the kinds of things that I think we're called upon to do in this position that we're in, serving the people of Shelburne. Um, so my feeling was it was sort of a uh, solution looking for a problem, really. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way, because I think your, your, your interest is really well founded, but I don't think we need a rule. Mm -hmm. I think we can do it. Um, and I think it creates a problem in the sense that, oh boy, two of us show up and somebody didn't follow the rule and take notes, or where are the notes? You know, so to me, I don't think it needs to be legislated. I think um, it's part of the organic process. Mm -hmm. Well, and my goal was just to, as I said, just to set something, you know, a, a straw man up to 
for questions, and I think the discussion has been very good, and I think all of your comments are fine. Um, it just it started, you know, in a lot of ways from this idea that we were going to have select board meetings in different places, yeah, exactly. and that yeah. sort of fell apart. Right. Yeah. And so it was, it was like, okay, can, is there another way of doing mm -hmm. it? Right. Um, I still like it for that reason. I mean, I'm sort of somewhere in the middle on this. I, I hear what you're saying, that you're an elected official and you do that. That's true. But it can be hard for people mm -hmm. to approach you, and yeah. if they don't have, yeah. right, if they're not used to that kind of outreach, it's somewhat intimidating. Mm -hmm. So we're not the most accessible in that respect. Yes, you are when you're and walking around the farmer's market. but And the, and the other thing that I think is really important is um, group dynamics. And I think having a group sitting in a room, knowing they're there to discuss issues, really is different than this environment and different than a one-on-one -on -one environment. And so being able to create a system where People know that, you know, uh, select board members will be available and you can have a very informal conversation and a group discussion about things really seems to be something that would add a aspect of town uh, input that we just don't have any other way. Yeah, it, it seemed to me we were dealing with three elements, one of which was the venue and uh, we've come up against really some intractable problems mm -hmm. there, uh, not only broadcast, but who could offer such an, a venue and how accessible was it to anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, I think we, we just ran up uh, against problems that we, we couldn't solve. The, the other element was uh, that we weren't necessarily uh, inviting uh, a, a discussions of, uh, of anything anybody was willing to listen to, in a sense, as much as we were eager to get input on not a not such a specific set of subjects that it would eliminate anything or out, you know or, or or prevent any other, but sort of focused. And uh, the the third element was. Uh, a distinction that could be made or a, a discrimination that could occur for those of us who have more time. Uh, time being a, a, a priority and, and scarce for all of us. Uh, so my sense is that, that we ended up talking about um, outreach and trying to, to uh, and vowing to continue to, to uh, communicate to the, to the to the residents that we're here, we're interested in what you uh, think, and 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 uh, so that we continue to make the point, whether it's come up and talk to us at at uh, uh, at the farmers market or some other uh, occasion. Uh, I'd like to see us t explore at least two ideas. One of which is to somehow do something with the school either in it or with it, or uh, I feel still there's a, a gap between us and school that shouldn't, shouldn't be. Uh, it's much too important in a community. Uh, the community recognizes no such thing. They're arms of the same body. And I'd love to see something that, that would, would invite a school-based audience to discuss things of, the, of interest to them uh, it's not just budget and there are separate funding, it's safety, uh, something, maybe a conversation about school safety that we could do one evening that would be convenient to, if not all of uh, some of us, maybe all of us, and we just simply meet as a group to talk over that. And the other, uh, uh, the other sense I had was to, to establish later in the fall some budget uh, discussions about budget, which any of us at any point could talk about. We're all going to be equally uh, uh, apprised and, and up to speed and might allow for people to come and not only express opinions about certain operating, cat certain categories, but taxation, other, other matters that are on people's minds. 
And very often I've had the feeling that budget sort of rides its own, own uh, uh, path right to, to the end of the year and then gets, gets publicized without a lot of involvement uh, over a period of time. And uh, we've concentrated it in one day, as, as we all know, of departmental requests. That seems to me a concentration that works against the more public information, the better, uh, because we tend not to have much discussion of it then during the meetings. So uh, I'd favor if we could figure out, Lee, if everyone feels it's useful to pursue as an idea some way during the budget process to be available to give updates and answer questions in some form. Uh, some of us, all of us, once, once maybe in November, whatever, whatever, even if we take some time out during a meeting, and obviously it could, it could occur could occur as a, as a portion of a meeting. But I really would like to see us think about doing something with the school uh, in, in their house. Uh, so the venue question gets, it's, it's going to be moot, and, uh, and, and if more than two of us wish to come, then we could, we could make it a meeting, uh, uh, an optional meeting for all of us, and who can come, come, and if it's more than three, it's more than three. Uh, so that's my sense of it. Uh, well, we feel strongly about that idea, which I'm definitely not opposed to. I think it's, I, I mean, it's a population I connect with frequently, and I think there's, especially the safety question, um, would is a really great one to have us all have together. Then shouldn't that just be a special select board meeting? And yeah, we can just I think warn it, that? that might be the best form of all because that may be. Uh, the, I, I agree, the boards jointly. Uh, but I think it would be really important to have school administration. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's an, it, it's an, you have an interesting take on it for some of us who've had a lot of public education in our background. Uh, there's still a little, there's still much to be learned about uh, what they're doing, how they're finding it, what, uh, what their sense of the community is, how they feel things fit. I mean, I, I just feel a great distance without children or grandchildren involved. And I don't think it's, uh, uh, I don't think it's unhealthy. I just don't think it's, uh, uh, it, it's representative of, of, of the feeling of community that Shelburne has and that we are, are responding to. So, uh, but I think you're right. It may, that may be the way to do it. And we find a time possibly where uh, everybody can uh, can meet together, and we could have a meeting there. I'm not sure about the broadcast to follow. I mean, there's all, always that possibility. Mm -hmm. But Sorry, I'd sure like to see that. that. We do the yeah. town meeting. Yeah, I'd sure like to see that. No. So that's my sense of it. I, I, I think the more we promote, talk about it, I agree, and promote and convey the feeling that this is genuine, we really mean this, with, you know, we're here because of, of, of the community, and uh, we're, we're genuinely interested in as much response from the community uh, as they're willing to make. Okay. Like okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Any discussion? Tom, Linda? Maddie's ready to go. <laughs> so Peter, much. thank you. Second. So moved. Second from Jamie. Any discussion? Uh, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Would anyone like